and a very warm welcome to Raj Malhotra AS and welcome to the series where we are taking up the main question papers of 2022 and we are going to have a detailed analysis. My name is Madhusudan Reddy and I am going to discuss on a detailed analysis about the general studies paper 1 mains examination with respect to geography. So, if you are not aware of this, we are coming up with the series where detailed analysis of all the subjects which have been part of the general studies mains have been going on and uh, today we are going to come up with geography and next in line there are other subjects please do follow us to get your detailed analysis on your mains examination papers. So let us begin with today's session, today I am going to take up geography as a subject. Before we go to get into the uh, questions, first let us look into the analysis and trend how exactly the geography paper has been doing since last 4 or 5 years. Now let us look from the 2017 the number of questions and the number of weightage if you look into they were around on an average there will be around 6 to 7 questions that have been asked with 10 markers and 15 markers. From 2017 onwards if you see on an average there are around 100 marks that have been asked from this paper but this year the number of weightage, the weightage percentage has increased, it is around 125 marks question paper has come from geography in your paper 1, right. And if you precisely go and look into the areas where the questions have come from, most of the questions have not come out from the blue, they have come out directly from the syllabus. See, once look into the syllabus of geography which has been given in the syllabus sheet of the UPSC which says that salient features of world physical geography. Next, they say that distribution of key natural resources across the world including South Asia and the Indian subcontinent. Now, they also mention about the factors responsible for the location of primary, secondary and tertiary industries along with the other parts of the world as well. The questions are very direct. This year, the paper if you look into, they are directly asked with percentage of analysis if you look into the analysis weightage has come down. The nature of direct hitting the bull's eye has been now the approach of the geography for your examiner. Now, see once look into the areas here deck and trap and natural resources they have asked a question for 10 marks on deck and trap asking about the potential of the deck and trap in terms of natural resources. Next one was wind energy in India that was also asked for 10 markers. Now, they asked about the rubber producing countries and environment that is not specific to India but across the world. You see, there is a detailed mention about the syllabus asking about including South Asia and the Indian subcontinent, right. See here, rubber producing countries and the environment, this is a question. The next question was also asked on globalization and the new technology resources. There were questions on tier 2 as well as and the nature of change of tier 2 cultures along with the significance of tropopos which is a direct question again and types of primary rocks or else the characteristics of a primary rocks which again has been asked for 10 markers. They also asked about the ocean currents and the primary factors that are responsible and also they have linked up this particular geography subject with the disaster management and they have also come up with the one of the color coding which has been asked in the cyclone as well. So, overall I would say these kind of questions are very direct and a question paper or a subject turns out to be difficult whenever the analysis part which has to be done in the examination the weightage is more. But overall if you look into the nature of analysis here is 50 percent and the nature of direct questions are 50 percent. Now in this context the toughness and the easy depends upon your preparation. So as a teacher I would say that this question paper is not much tough for an aspirant who has been thorough with their NCRTs as well as they are with the phase of the preparation, right. So, let us get quickly into our questions, what exactly are the questions that they have been asked and let us look into the analysis as well. Now, the first one, let us look into the question here, that question says that describe the characteristics and types of primary rocks which has been asked for 150 words and in 10 marks. See, whenever you look into the question, firstly you have to look into the areas of keywords and the directives that have been asked in the question. Now, here it says that describe the characteristics and types of the primary rocks. They only ask to describe but not to discuss. When you are asked to describe, you only need to describe the rock, right. And it is asked for 10 marker and 150 words. So, firstly in the introduction part, <coughs> what you can do is you can define a primary rock, okay. Primary rock is one such rock where the crystals of crystals have been formed for the first time. Right, 
that means a new rock for formed for the first time that is your primary rock and primarily these rocks are none other than the igneous rocks. Igneous rocks are those rocks which directly come out from lava and they cool down. Now this cooling down can happen within the earth and the cooling down can happen when it comes out of the earth. Now the, whenever the rock that gets cooled down within the earth it is called as intrusive and the rock when it cools down above the surface of the earth it is called as extrusive. Now there are intrusious, intrusive igneous rocks and extrusive igneous rocks. When you have the intrusive igneous rocks, an example for this, an example for this can be your granite, granitic rocks and here you can mention about the basaltic rocks. See here what they have asked is the characteristics of a rock that too they asked for the description. Now in terms of description of a rock, a rock always have physical properties and chemical properties. You need to describe the characteristics of these rocks. Now the characteristics can be looked from the angle of texture, whether it is more denser or less denser, what is the color, what is the mineral composition and also the size of the grains or the crystals. Along with it, you can also mention other descriptive characteristics that are part of. Whenever a rock gets cooled, suppose if you think that there is volcanic activity and this volcanic activity has led to a volcano. If this volcano is within the ocean, the rocks that are formed, they get cooled very fast, right? These rocks, they get cooled very fast. This process of cooling very fast is called as quenching. Now, whenever this quenching process happens, the crystal size depends upon the nature of cooling. If, the, if it is cooled very, very slowly, the size of the crystals will be big. If it is cooled very fastly, the size of the crystals will be less. That means small in size. Now here you can mention about the size of crystals. Okay. Size of the crystals can be for granite and for basalt. Okay. For granitic size, the, it, is, it is a slow cooling process where the crystals are big and the crystals are small. Next is the density. You can mention you know, an angle of density as well. Density angle, basaltic rocks are having high density and they have low density. And when it comes to silica composition, you can write about this granitic rock has high silica and it has low silica. Near about 70% of the granitic rocks are formed because of high silica content. And moreover, you can also talk about the cooling process as compared to the granitic rocks and basaltic rocks which are intrusive and extrusive rocks, the time taken for the rock to be cooled. It also decides the nature and characteristics of the rocks. So usually the time taken for the cooling of granitic rocks is more. Now this is less. Even if you are in a position to mention about the rocks, in the introduction part you can def define what are primary rocks. Once you define the primary rocks, after that you can talk about the nature of rocks by giving some examples of granitic and basalt. If you are have studied even the NCRT, in the NCRT they clearly mention the types of basaltic rocks and also ignusive intrusive rocks. You also know some other rocks which are part of interior of the earth that are intrusive rocks which are part of your basalt. You can also give examples of those rocks. And see here the demand of the question is only to describe the characteristics and types of primary rocks. Here the types of primary rocks are intrusive as well as ext extrusive. In the intrusive there is granite right and when it comes to extrusive it is basalt. Now here you have to mention few examples and their relevance. I think this is how the question need to be approached. Right. Now coming to the next question, our next question which has been asked about is the discuss the meaning of the color coded weather warnings for the cyclone prone areas given by the Indian Meteorological Department. Now let us look into for the directives that have been asked in the questions. It is asking discuss the meaning of color coded weathering system. It is asking to discuss. See whenever a question which is asked to discuss, we have to discuss in detail. Right. 
and this is a 10 marker question we have to discuss with respect to the Indian Meteorological Department. So, here the happy thing is that even the aspirants who have not who do not know the answer they can somehow derive that answer because Indian Meteorological Department has standardized, standardized color codings. The standardized color codings always do have green, yellow, orange and red. So, green, yellow, orange and red are the standardized color codings for all the warning systems, most of the warning systems that are given by the Indian Meteorological Department. Under these conditions, even the cyclone also has similar kind, but a well studied aspirant would know that whenever there is 72 hours time period, at that time period you have no warning or the forecast will start. Okay. Yellow color warning is given at 48 hours time period and this is during the cycle, cyclone or 12 hours before the cyclone and action taken is usually after the post cyclone. Okay. Now, here what you have to do is in general you have to talk about the cyclone and the color coded systems with their meanings. Right. Now, by this the warnings of the Indian Meteorological Department in the introduction, in the introduction part you can talk about the warnings of the Indian Meteorological Department are mainly administered to keep the administrative mechanism to keep them on the toes and to keep them well prepared. Right. Now, in the introduction part you can start with this and then you can come to the color coding parts in which it says that it asks to discuss, while discussing you have to say that green color or else you can mention that the color coding consists of four different colors and all of these colors have certain significances. For example, green color, green color has no severe weather that means the weather is not severe and expected no advers adversary issues. But still the government mechanism can take prior recommendations from the various departments to handle the upcoming cyclone. So, these are some things which you can talk about. Next coming to the yellow color, yellow color indicates that be updated, you need to be updated and it indicates severe weather by the which can spread across several days. Whenever an yellow color warning system has been issued, it is an indication that there is going to be a cyclone or there is going to be a big weather system which is going to be on your particular land for at least some time, some time period. Right. It is not just for one day, it can be more than for two or three days. Now, orange color or umber color it say that be prepared it is assured as a warning of extremely bad weather now it tells about extremely bad weather within the potential of disruption usually these kind of warnings are given at the time period somewhere around 12 to 24 hours ki time period ki beach mein and all the government me machinery especially the disaster management forces are put up with respect to their machines and men and manpower ready for that right and talk about the red color and after that you can mention about the discussions which you have talked about in the prior area right now this can be the approach you can go ahead with the question the next question is discuss the natural resource potential of the deccan trap see the natural resource potential of the deccan trap in 150 words and 100 marks it talks about the natural resource potential it is not asking how much you have but how much potential this natural resources has in the deccan trap area so in the introduction part you can start to mention about the formations of the deccan trap are primarily because of the extrusive igneous rocks which have been cooled over many millions of years in this in this process most of the rocks are primary rocks which are present there and it extends from all the way from Gujarat to somewhere in the southern part of the northern part of the Karnataka including some parts of Telangana and Maharashtra. Now, this is your Deccan trap before you this you before we venture into this question first let me try to explain you the formation here. Imagine this is your India I mean this entire process this entire my hand is India and imagine there is a volcanic activity beneath this India. The formations of this Deccan trap has happened when there was volcanic activity beneath the India and this volcanic activity came over India and for millions of years the volcanic activity was active and over a period of time this volcano has cooled down. When it has cooled down the India was on a continuous movement right the India was not at a one single place there was continuous movement of the India so slowly it led to the formations of multiple volcanic eruptions and one such volcanic eruption was your Deccan trap. Now, in the Deccan trap 
this is the first formations south of the Deccan Trap you have Telangana Plateau and you also have Karnataka Plateau as well. So in this Deccan Trap it is asked about what are the potential natural resources it is asking about natural resources. Now in the natural resources in the recent times the NGRI that is National Geophysical Research Institute has said that NGRI said that there is in huge potential of oil and natural gas along with the shale gas as well. Now, where is it present? It is present in the KG Basin, Krishna Godavari Basin as well as the across the river Godavari, Tapi, Narmada and Mahanadi. And Tapi, Narmada, Mahanadi are also the gaps that are present in the Deccan Traps. Okay? There are gaps. Now, gaps are nothing but if there are series of hills in between, if you find a plain area that is called as gap in this plain area or a low lying area. Now in this low lying area you can have a river or you can have a valley. So wherever you have valleys and rivers there is also a potential area for windmill energy right the winds will be blowing very fast so that wind can be in your energy. Now the natural resource potential can be also your solar energy all throughout the 365 days it has intense sunlight no matter whatever the season the natural resource potential here is solar potential and also it talks about the natural gas reserves. This Deccan Trap also has gas reserves. What are these gas reserves? The gas reserves are shale gas. It also has liquid petroleum gas as well as other crude oil mechanisms. And the Mesozoic Gondwana sediments which are formed in the Mesozoic time period, they are present just at the maximum of 3 km thickness. So they are also potential rich source. Along with this there is also a potential for uranium in the Deccan Trap area. And these Deccan Traps are hard rocks. And these hard, hard rocks, they do have geosynclines as well as aquifers within them. So these aquifers are the potential areas wherever the water gets stored within them. So that areas, if you are mapped, that can be the potential source for good water resources. So the potentiality of Deccan Trap can be studied in terms of phys physical, and human aspects as well. So, in the physical aspects, if you look into the Jal Jeevan mission, which was part of the Maharashtra state government, they are also trying to explore the same thing in the potential of underground water or ground water. <coughs> and here you have to know the older the rocks, they are they will be the stronger for synclines. Okay, if the rock is more older, then at the same time they will have synclines that synclines can be utilized for the water stability or the water storage capacity. They will have good storage of water. That is why Maharashtra and other areas even though if there is drought prone in this region but with the potential mapping of aquifers, potential mapping of the aquifers can actually yield better results in the Maharashtra region. So overall it asked about the discussion of the natural resource potential. Now the discussion can be studied resource in the atmosphere and resource that is present on the ground and the resource that is under the ground. Overall, the current affairs aspects of National Geophysical Research Institute which has given its report saying that there is huge amount of gas. Well, at the same time, if you also give other additional inputs of natural resources that can be of a great value to your answer. Now this answer can be approached in the following way. Like one talk about the introduction, give the introduction where the Deccan Traps formation which are part of, which are present all the way from Gujarat to Laker, southern part of Karnataka, northern part of Karnataka. Then talk about the extensions and it also has Narmada river, Tapi river and Godavari river. Then come into the potential resources that are present in these rivers as well as the natural resources in the form of sunlight, in the form of water. It also has very huge potential for the hydroelectric powers as well because these waters, they make waterfalls here. So, Overall, by mentioning, you can move ahead with this answer. Now, coming to the next question, it says that the next question here is, examine the potential of wind energy in India and explain the reasons for their limited spread. See, it asks about examine. Okay, the director here is, directive here is examine the potential of wind energy in India and explain the reasons for the limited spatial spread. Now you have to know spatial spread means you have to explain in terms of bird's eye view. Wherever geographically where are the areas which you find this potential energy of wind and what, what are the areas where there is no potential energy of the wind. Okay. 
and it is asking for explanation and it is also asking for examine. So, here there are two whenever there are two different directives you have to address these two different directives in the same answer. So, if you get into the introductory part you have to know that India has huge amount of potential in terms of wind energy. Now, what are the areas for this potential? You have to know that the potential is mainly present across the western coast of India and in the eastern coast it is lying only in the southeastern part of the eastern coast right and some parts of the northeast coast. Okay. But most of the potential en energy of wind it is present in Ladakh as well as the western Ghats area. Now, why is it present only in these areas? Here you have to examine that it is because the winds are very much active here. If you look into the coastline of East India, eastern part of India, here on an average you find good amount of cyclones. Near about the tropical region on an average every year it has somewhere around 100 plus cyclones out of which 10 to 12 cyclones you get to see in the Bay of Bengal itself. Suppose if you establish the hydrothermal power, the wind energy here, the potential for damage is very high, right. But on the western coast of India, we also have seasonal, seasonal winds that are coming over and also there are some gaps that are present on the western coast. If you see, especially the Maharashtra area, which is having Talgat, Borgat, and also in the southern region, you have Palgat. So, wherever these gaps are present, in these gaps, the wind flow will be active. On a continuous basis, the wind flow will be there, because of which you can easily set up the potential wind energies here. Okay. Along with it, on the western coast of Rajasthan also because of the varied pressures, the wind potential is high. So, the setting up of the wind, pot wind mills can also be done here and also look into the Gujarat area. Gujarat area also has a radial drainage pattern along with strong winds which are coming from the Arabian Sea uh, every seasonal. So, these are also the areas where you can have good wind potential. One of the example here is Mandvi. If you have gone to Mandvi area or if you have been to the Kutch area, these are the potential areas. See, of course, in the northern in the northern plains area also, you can set up your windmills, but mostly the winds are not much active there. It is a plain area. In the plain area, the potential for these winds are not much of active. And on the other way, if you look into, there is a problem with respect to setting up of these windmill, energy, windmill uh, power plants. Because the windmill potential at the 100 meters and the windmill potential at the 200 meters, it keeps on varying. In India, the winds are not active all throughout the year in certain areas. So, the potential for 100 meters and the potential for 200 meters is different. So, you can also mention that the varied potential energy is one of the major reason for the setting up of the windmills across the nation. And the National Institute of Wind Energy as well as which estimates that a total wind energy potential of 302 gigawatts Hamare pass potential hai itna and at a height of what? At a height of 100 meters, right? And India has a coastline of 7600 meters and this which has a potential of 127 gigawatts as per the National Institute of Wind Energy's report. So, by you can also give sightings to these reports and when you look into the second part of the question which is reasons for the limited spatial spread, you need to know that the reasons are very much concerned with the universal funding challenge. Firstly, funding and capital, the setting up of this industry, it needs too much of infrastructure and the capital requirement is very huge and challenges for the land, land acquisition along with that policy making which are the normal regular problems and Arabian Sea warming up along with west coast preferred. We have climate change issue, these are also some of the problems while citing you can also talk about the changing weather patterns and the insurance penetration is low and the premium is very very high in the industry of wind. So, these are some of the challenges and they asked about the limited spatial spread. See the limited spatial spread biggest challenge here is the topography of India. India has near about 40 percent of the total landmass in India is hills and wherever you have these hills the setting up of these projects is difficult. And the rest of the area is 60 percentage of its land. In this, mostly the coastal areas are the potential areas where you can set up the wind power mills and also Ladakh. 
but why Ladakh? If you see the map here, you also have Ladakh as a region, right? But why Ladakh? Because Ladakh is also a region where you have very strong winds, which is also categorized as in the times of disaster management, this is also categorized as a cyclonic disaster, though there are no direct cyclones that are being part of this. Because a cyclone is defined as an area in terms of disaster management I am talking about, whenever the winds are more than 60 kilometers per hour. The 60 kilometers per hour winds can easily be seen in the Ladakh region because of the local weather condition changes on a regular basis. Right. Now coming to the next question, the next question talks about what are the forces that influence the ocean currents and describe their role in the fishing industry of the world. Now this has two parts. First part it is asking about the forces and the second part it is asking their role in terms of fishing industry of the world. Now this role is with respect to the oceanic currents, okay? they are with respect to the oceanic currents. Firstly there are two different kinds of forces, number one there are primary forces and secondary forces. Primary forces can be further subdivided into first one it is your wind. Wind creates friction. Okay. Now the second one is your Coriolis force. Gravity. Hydraulic gradient. These are the major primary forces which influence the movement of water in the ocean. So, the first force is wind. Whenever a wind is, wind starts to move, wind will start to generate the friction between the water and the wind. So, that is the primary reason why the water starts to move. Now, on a continuous basis of this water movement and this, this packet of movement of water in the form of a river is called as ocean currents. So, see here, the other reason for the movement of the ocean currents is also solar heating. Okay. Now, this creates the variation in the solar heating will create the pressure gradient force within the water as well. That means temperature gradient. Temperature gradient for it, if you look into the polar regions will have cold water and the water which is near to the equator it will have warm water. You can discuss about these four or five factors along with that. Now start to describe the role in the fishing industry of the world. The role of the fishing industry if you look into wherever you see upwelling, upwelling of water, especially the cold water it brings in good nutrients. Now you can cite examples the great grand banks, you can also talk about the west coast of Chile, the mixing of Obesho and Kuresho currents in the ocean water. If you see, the best fishing grounds are areas wherever you see the upwelling of water. Okay. The upwelling can be very much evidently seen in the west coast of the Peru and the mixing of Labrador current with the Gulf Stream. In the Gulf Stream area, and also the mixing area of Ovesho and Kuresho. The major significance for the ocean water currents is the fisheries industries wherever you find the mixing of water. By citing the examples and also drawing the ocean currents map, I think sufficient this answer would be addressed in detail. Now you can also give the reference to the Ekman effect as well. Okay. In the introduction, you can talk about the what are ocean currents, definition of the ocean currents by mentioning the forces of the ocean currents and then talk about the forces one by one and also describe the role in the fishing industry stating that by giving examples of Horatio Creatio currents and also the currents such as Luvian current and the West Australian current, the West Coast of Peru and also the Alaskan current and Labrador current. So, these are some of the examples because whenever there is fresh upwelling of water, oxygen is pulled up 
and this oxygen brings out so much of nutrients this nutrients will lead to the good fisheries industries and along with the fish fish industries will come up and fish industries with technology they will be rich and strong there the next question which talks about mention the significance of straits and isthmus in international trade which is asked for 250 words in 15 marks so it asked the significance here in terms of significance it only asked to mention it is not asking to explain the process mention the significance of straits and isthmus in international trade so this answer need to be a better aspirant will be writing this kind of answer with respect to examples they'll choose out certain examples across the world and they'll start to mention the significance of this straits and isthmus firstly define what is an isthmus and what is a strait an isthmus is a region which connects two big land masses but whereas a strait is a region or a strait is a small pathway which connects two different water bodies some of the examples of the straits are strait of gibraltar or strait of malacca which has highest transportation within them and also you talk about the isthmus isthmus of panama isthmus of kra isthmus of kra is present in the which divides actually divides the arabian sea with that of the south china sea as well and it connects two big land bodies of thailand right so these are some of the examples okay now looking into the significance if you look into the significance here see guys just a minute number 1 Firstly, they are the natural sites for ports. They are also having trade routes, canal linkages and terrestrial and aquatic trade ports or routes they can be found. All of these routes can be found in the straits and cross only. They are key sites for the communication also and also for the cultural exchange as well as the military outposts. You look into the major military outposts, they are always set up across these straits because straits are the pathways where the trade happens between two countries and that is where the collection of tax takes place, that is where the control of the international regime also handles. See, our outpost even in terms of the tri-service command is set up near to the Andaman Nicobar, right, because in whenever any kind of extreme ex uh, emergencies that figures onto the nation, it is the Strait of Malacca that can be utilized. You look into the Strait of Malacca, which is present here, it is acting as a gateway between the eastern part of the uh, so eastern part of Asia and the rest of the world. Right? You look into the Strait of Gibraltar, it is acting as a connecting agent between the west western region of the world and the Asian region of the world. Now look into the other straits, for example, Strait of Dardanelles or Strait of Bosphorus, which Russia, the major regions for Russia going for war is also one of the big reason. One of the reason is your straits, significance of the straits. So, here, just a minute. Okay. In terms of the international trade, you have to look forward for one communication, looking out for resources as well as economic aspects, right? Okay, and by citing few examples, I think you guys can move forward along with the examples of your Suez Canal and the Isthmus of Panama, Cape of Good Hope route, as well as other European and African connectivities. Next, come to the next question that is, your troposphere is a very significant atmospheric layer that determines weather processes. How? Now, in this question, what you have to do is Firstly, write about in the intro part, you can start to mention about the tropopause. The troposphere is a layer which is present between tropopause and the surface of the earth. In this layer, most part of the life essential services which are provided within the earth are present in this region. That is, it is the lowest part of the atmosphere, the energy of troposphere is very, very high. The compression and expansion of the air also takes place here. The principles of heat processes such as Conduction, convection and the conduction, convection and radiation also takes place here and compression of air, expansion of air and compression of air. 
also takes place here along with it clouds all the clouds that is 90 percent of the clouds are present here they this leads to the rainfall phenomena and other varied geo atmospheric phenomena right so the adiabatic lapse rate concepts these are some things where you can discuss in this particular part by also giving the tropopause you can also talk about the tricellular model where the mentioning of easterlies westerlies and polar easterlies most of them are confined to the the winds are confined to the tropo sphere right along with that you can also mention about the greenhouse gas effect which has a great influence on meteorologies such as it has direct contact with earth's surface number one the heating of the earth's atmosphere starts from the troposphere and then it goes into the higher regions the adiabatic lapse rate the increase or decrease all these things takes place within the troposphere the troposphere being the lowermost region it is the region where the life forms exist the energies exchange and also the living services the essential services of the ecology all of these are part of your troposphere now it is asked being asked for 15 marks so they asked about the significant atmospheric layer that is troposphere which determines weather processes and it also asked about how it asks how now this how need to be explained how are we going to explain this we going to explain this through the tricellular model by the process of conduction convection and radiation you can also talk about the heat budget the heat budget of the earth the earth maintains its heat most of its heat is confined within the troposphere itself so that determines weather processes that weather processes are primarily determined by the process of conduction convection and radiation right next the next question which is asked is describing the distribution of rubber producing countries indicate the major environmental issues faced by them firstly in the intro part what you can talk is though major part of the major part of the world's rubber plantation is mostly confined to asia the natural source of rubber or the native rubber cultivation is mostly done in the other parts of the world such as you can mention the sentences that describe despite natural rubber being native to the amazon basin theek hai natural rubber jo hai amazon basin ka native hai but still 90% of the world rubber is grown in asia that means 90% of the total rubber is grown in asia so by addressing the anomaly this particular part you can write in intro by addressing the anomaly you can say that this is because of the climatic conditions and the industrial development in that particular region by starting that you can also write about the climatic conditions what are the climatic conditions that are required the climatic conditions that are required to grow rubber is it is a tropical crop which needs that 25 to 35 degrees celsius and which also needs a plantation that could withstand for 20 around 30 odd years right and huge investment these conditions are very favorable only in the southeast asia theek hai so, then start to mention about the conditions by addressing the conditions you can also go for the distribution aspect the distributions are mostly confined to the areas such as the southeast asia and the eastern part of asia rest of the areas the distribution is very limited why because the rainfall firstly rainfall is limited and rubber plantation needs somewhere around it needs near about 150 plus centimeters of rainfall theek hai that is available in the southeastern nations and in the equatorial regions most of the rubber you see they are present in the equatorial regions and it is a tropical crop 
Now let's once go back and look into this question here. Describing the distribution of rubber producing countries indicate the major environmental issues faced by them. Now here the environmental issues are very very common issues. You can also give examples citing the rubber plantation being one of the most economic plantations such as it can get the seeds of the rubber, leaves of the rubber, even the stem of the rubber. It All the plant has economic significance because of which the rubber plantations over a period has created deforestation in many parts of the world and it consumes lot of water. The consumption of water in the rubber industry is very very huge and it uses lot of chemicals when it when it has to be ex extracted. Now wherever the rubber industry is there, the rubber industry takes off the lower cultivations that are present there and it also spoils the soil which is present in that particular area. Now it has an impact on the natural vegetation also, it also impact on the uh, biodiversity loss along with it. suppose. A plantation agriculture when it has to be shifted from one particular area to another area which is non-native under those conditions you will see certain loss of biodiversity. So overall it also leads to the biodiversity right one deforestation consuming large water discharge of massive amounts of waters biodiversity and natural vegetation which requires soil good quality of soil and more amount of fertilizers and these plantations have been grown for near about once it starts to give the crop from 7 years to 30 odd years this is the life of the rubber plant and once it is cut down again it takes so much of time. So in this between time the soil takes so much time to replenish even the 2 to 3 years time period is not sufficient for that time for that particular area because rubber plantations are grown in areas where there is good amount of rainfall that rainfall will wash away the nutrients that are present on the soil right. So these are some of the environmental losses that have been part of that. Now the last question that is elucidate the relationship between globalization and new technologies in a world of scarce resources with special reference to India it clearly asked to mention about India here in this conditions you have to elucidate one this is the direct directive that is relationship between globalization and the new technologies in the world of scarce resources. Firstly you have to know that globalization has phases and the current phase which we are in is called the 4.0 globalization phase. This is the last stage of globalization which involves cutting edge technologies as well as artificial intelligence. Today we are going for artificial intelligence along with the machine learning concepts. This shrinks in distances. Suppose whenever these kind of issues are there, these kind of technologies are there. Suppose you wanted to perform a surgery sitting in India and perform in Africa. It is very easy by using the artificial intelligence and machine learning, right. So these kind of things, the barriers of travel has been cut down, the barriers of transportation of resources that have been cut down and the distance factor has been shrinked down to lower areas. Now the relationship between globalization as well as the new technologies that is what you have to identify by identifying this such as intangible flow of data and information can be moved from one, one country to another country and great participation by emerging economies such as India and also more intensive flow of energy will take more intensive flow of knowledge will take place from one country to another country and there will be a lot big role in terms of digital infrastructure and the it becomes equally important instant global access to information can also be available and innovation comes into outflow. Moreover, whenever you have these innovations within confined to local areas, when it goes to the outflow, the economy also flourishes. Now let us come back and look into the question here, relationship between globalization and new technologies in the world of scarce resources. The new technologies you can emphasize on the artificial intelligence, machine learning programs, the data flow, data patterns. These are some of the areas where the new, new resources in terms of scarce resources they are going to help. Now what are these scarce resources? Let us quickly look into the scarce, scarce resources as well. Number 1, climate change is an inevitable thing and it is going to pose a greater, greater risk to the entire world. Now scarcity issues if you see resource recycling jo hai, mainly which have companies have launched by Buy, the buyback policy if you take into or technological processes that can increase both economic growth and the better management of resources as well as the climate change and the scarcity will hit this poor people all over. Under these conditions once if you identify the linkage and then address those linkages with the scarce resources one you can also link up, link up with poverty, okay. link it with climate change. Okay. 
and also the e-waste right now india terms may when you look into india has a dual challenge one the population is very very high and the rapid technological change which has also has a dividing edge it can act as a dividing edge now if you look into the demographic dividend and the rapid technological changes the demographic dividend is an asset in this asset if you don't tap this asset it will turn out to be a disaster now how can you tap this asset the asset can be tapped by inducing the natural resources as well as artificial resources by tapping in the scarce resources our scarce resource is unutilization of our po our population now if you can drive that that can be an issue at the same time this can also turn out to be a disaster as well now if you have more population when you bring in artificial intelligence of course the work that has to be done by many hundreds of people or with the labor this can do it 3d printing technology can cut down the labor industry in the construction so these are some of the areas where you can quote examples and give examples now in the technological processes is nothing but the where placing high premium on skills there are technologies which place high premium on the skills and may generate more inequality that means only people who are well equipped they will be paid in terms of knowledge people who are not knowledgeable they won't be paid now in terms of globalization artificial intelligence when it comes in the machine learning or else the other te 3d printing technologies these kind of technologies when they come in only those people who are aware of these technologies they will be paid rest of the people mostly in terms of this demographic dividend to india which is has to be converted into an asset it might also turn out to be a failure now see the question here it talks about relationship between globalization and the new technologies it is asking to elucidate whenever any elucidate comes into picture you have to give examples right you should give examples now in this example pattern with respect to india you have to quote examples right in india number one the demographic challenge which is a problem and globalizations you look into you have problems like financial crisis pandemics as well as transboundary security issues terrorism these are some of the problems that can be handled right or that can be identified so these are the questions that have been part of the geography if for the pdf of this you can download this pdf in our raj malhotra ias telegram channel see you guys with the next subject be stay tuned to our youtube channel if you do like it please press that uh, subscribe button and like us thank you guys